let Heather and Jonathan take it away. All right. So Julie, I'll go ahead. Okay. Julie, I'll go ahead and get started. So if um, if all is working well on my end, you should now see um, my screen sharing. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I do. Fantastic. Excellent. And so just as a reminder, if you're not currently muted, because Julie is recording this session, please take the time to mute your microphone so there's not audio artifacts coming across. And um, because I hear quite a few things going on, someone's eating and someone's typing away on their laptop, I know that at least two people aren't quite muted. So you could take a, some time to do that. But my name is Heather Kinsey, and I am joining you today from Anchorage, Alaska. And I am with the Strive Group. So we are a full service consulting firm here in town. And then also joining me today is Jonathan. Jonathan is one of our beloved colleagues, and he is the principal of Halcyon Con Consulting. And he's also located here in the Anchorage Bowl. And what we'll talk about today is twofold. We've got sort of bifurcated our, our topics here. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, disruption, leadership in times of disruption. And then Jonathan is going to take over and talk a little bit about psychological safety. And we only have 30 minutes, so please don't expect us to dive into any granular details, but just give you a little bit, some food for thought. Think of it that way. So as Julie had said, there's very, very, um, there's a lot of disruption going on right now. We've got um, a global pandemic. We've got an economic crisis. We have um, we have other types of social disruptions and disruptors um, causing stress and anxiety in our workforce, in our communities, in our neighborhoods. And it really becomes imperative for us as leaders to sort of, um, as you'll hear from Jonathan later, settle that ball, so to speak. And so I was doing a little bit of research and I often will head out to Harvard Business Review to, you know, I don't know, spur on some creativity or to get me thinking about different perspectives or to read their analytics. They do quite a few surveys in their own right. And I came across this one and it was particularly about the current situation that we find ourselves in and the, the faith or the, or the confidence that workforce has in their leadership. And the numbers to me were not um, surprising, but nonetheless alarming. So 15% at, based on this Harvard Business Review um, uh, uh, survey that had gone out, 15% of employees had reasonable confidence, a reasonably high level of confidence in their leadership. And, and, what, I, and what it means by that is that they've got that much confidence that their leaders can get them through this disruption. 61% of the workforce said that they were pretty tentative. Um, they weren't quite able to um, say that they had confidence, but they were not necessarily damning of their leadership either. But then 24% reported that they were worried, that they did not believe and have confidence in their leadership to get them through these times of disruption. And so if I had, if I had asked you to do the quick math, that's 85% are not confident that they're not able to say, we are confident that our leadership um, knows, knows how to get us through this. And that to me is a pretty alarming number, not just for myself, right? I'm a business owner and I look out to my employees and I'm wondering if they fall in that typical um, percentage that we see here on this slide, but also for our clients, you know, and what am I doing to help my clients because they're the executive leaders of companies and they're leaders of organizations like yourself. What am I doing to help them instill that confidence? Because I believe that is a responsibility and a burden that we must um, willfully carry. And so what I'd like to talk about are some little things that we as leaders could do to instill that confidence, to at least give the perception to our workforce that we've got this covered. And the first thing that I'd like to talk about is, um, well, technically it's maximizing your effectiveness. I only have four slides, then I'm turning it over to, to Jonathan. But the first thing is about your visibility, is about you being um, willing and to be present, authentic, and honest and approachable with your staff. I think that everybody 
has their own way of doing that. You know, some of us use a pretty passive approach and we have an open door policy. And so if people have the courage to come and speak with us, then yes, we are going to be present and visible to them at that time. Some of us are a little bit more proactive. And this is what I think we need to lean towards during times of disruption is we need to not just remain visible and keep our door open, but invite people to come in. Let them know that we are going to be transparent, fully present, um, authentic leaders for them in that time, at a time that is good for them, not necessarily at a time that is good for us. Part and parcel with that is encouraging that candid dialogue or otherwise soliciting that candid dialogue or soliciting that feedback. Um, I think that's really important during times of disruption that we show that we're not closed down to ideas or that we're not closed down to different paradigms of thinking. And how do we prove that, that we're not closed down is we seek people um, or, or we solicit people to pry our brains open. You know, we invite different perspectives, even though we're not likely to agree with them. Um, we demonstrate to our, to anybody that's paying attention and when we're in leadership position, a lot of people are paying attention to us, um, but demonstrate to anybody who is paying attention that we will um, um, value other people's perceptions, even when they um, are in misalignment with our own. Um, a great example of this I just saw last week was with a business leader that was afraid to have a conversation about the Black Lives Matter movement and what was happening, um, you know, soon to happen over the weekend. There were going to be protests, there were going to be rallies, and he didn't necessarily want to encourage his people to participate, but he wanted to empower them to make their own decisions to participate if they wanted to, even though he himself didn't necessarily believe in the need to rally or believe in the need to protest or even agree with the need to protest or the reasons why they're protesting it. And he knew that his staff probably knew that about him, but he didn't want them to be afraid that they couldn't, you know, go in and exercise what they believed was right, right? So it was a really, really difficult conversation. He knew it was going to be perceived as awkward and uncomfortable for himself and for others, but he wanted to acknowledge their thoughts and their and their um, and their opinions on the matter, and he wanted to let them know that they were empowered to be authentically themselves, even if he disagreed with that. Right. So I, it's a time to do that during these these disrupting times, whether it's social disruption disruption or otherwise. Another thing that I think we can do as leaders to manage through disruptive times is to practice mindfulness. And, and I try very, very hard to do this. I, I'm not a big meditator. I don't, I don't you know, find my Zen often. Um, and for long periods of time, I, I, I struggle with, with consistency on this. However, I do find little moments, you know, three minutes or five minutes a day to just set aside time and to think to think about what's going on, what might my reaction be, what might my emotions be that are hidden within that reaction. Um, I've learned to park my responses so I don't overly react or um, um, overcompensate. Um, I think sometimes as leaders, especially when there's a lot going on, we have a tendency to, to, to do a bit too much, right? So I park my responses so when I when I am engaging, I'm engaging at the right level for the right amount of time. And then I try to ask myself always, is my action or is my response or is my behavior, is it going to help the situation and to, as Jonathan will say, settle the ball or will it hinder our progress on that? And if it's going to hinder the progress, I need to refrain from doing it. And the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Jonathan is, in order to maximize our effectiveness during these times of disruption, I believe that we as leaders, we have to maintain our strategic awareness, right? Our organizations, your libraries, my consulting firm, we are bigger and um, more impactful than just this global pandemic or just this economic downfall or just this or just that. But we are only larger than that if we learn to, to, to maintain our strategic awareness. 
And again, someone is not muted, so there's a lot of feedback right now. So if you could mute your microphones. But if we maintain our strategic awareness, what I mean by that is that we have to be very diligent to look forward, right? To, to imagine um, and, and visualize our organization through whatever is disrupting us at that time. And one of the ways that we can do that better, in my opinion, is this, if we also learn to look left and look right. You know, what are our peers doing in similar spaces? How is that, um, how, how are those outcomes for them? Are they enjoying some of those outcomes? Or are they further hindered by some of those outcomes? What are our other stakeholders doing, right? What are organizations that are similar to us, but not necessarily in our industry? What are those outcomes, right? What are they doing to help or hinder the overall results? And then finally, is what is our workforce capable of? What are our current assets capable of? Could be technological assets, could be financial assets, um, assets, or it could be our human capital assets. But what are they capable of and what are, are they willing to do so we can visualize ourselves past this disruption? And I found that I can maintain that strategic awareness only when I do a full 360 view and I take time to actually look at those outcomes and look at those behaviors and those, those activities and to see if I can't capitalize on other people's successes or on other people's lessons learned. And I, and I, have, I have full confidence that my staff can help me do that if I empower them to do so. So that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan because Jonathan will talk a little bit about how you as leaders can prepare your staff and almost enable an, um, a, an environment or a culture that allows them the confidence that they need to share with you their ideas and their concerns. All right, so Jonathan, go ahead and I'll follow you. And I'm gonna mute myself, Jonathan. Thank you. I just realized I had myself muted there. I was trying to be good. So hi, everybody. My name is Jonathan King. I'm the founder of Halcyon Consulting, uh, located in Anchorage. Just to give you a little bit of a back, uh, background, uh, my academic training is as an economist. I've actually been a consulting economist up here in Alaska for almost two decades. Um, and I'm also an International Coaching Federation accre accredited coach. And so I spend about half my time working uh, in the economics consulting area and another half of my time working in the leadership development area. And I wanna to talk today uh, about psychological safety and the importance of psychological safety for you and your uh, staff members. So first of all, psychological safety is, is really the ability for team members to feel that they can take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other and that they can bring them whole, their whole selves to teams without fear of being put down or knocked aside or, immediately hearing the infamous no, but, or however. And about a decade ago, uh, Google decided that they wanted to figure out uh, what set their high performing teams apart. And so they started this project called Project Aristotle, where they really looked at what made their high performing teams high performing teams. And the number one common factor between these high performing teams was that the team members could be psychologically safe. And this psychological safety was so important, it was actually more important than dependability, structure and clarity, the work having meaning, or the work having an impact. Uh, and so what we've determined and what we've figured out is that if you wanna have a high performing team, then you as a leader, the first and foremost thing that you need to be working on is working on creating a psychologically safe environment where people can come and they can play their hardest and they can play their best and they don't have to worry about, um, uh, about sort of the, some of the backbiting and psychologically unsafe behavior that happens in a lot of our, a lot of our workforces. And, and I think that all of us on the call have been in work environments where we didn't feel psychologically safe where we didn't feel like we could voice ourselves and we didn't feel like we could ask questions. We didn't feel like we could voice our doubts. We didn't feel like we could suggest ideas. And if you can't do those things, you can't really have a high performing team. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of the reasons why psychological safety is so important and what you can do to, to help it. So Heather, can we have the next slide? 
So about 75% of your brain is actually, 75% of your lower brain is dedicated to dealing with this guy here, right? Which is the threat of the, of the environment around you. So we all, um, we all evolved. I mean, our ancestors evolved on the savannas of Africa. Uh, if you've ever been to the savannas of Africa, there's a lot of very large critters. There's also a lot of critters that will happily eat a human. Um, there's also a lot of very small critters that are happy to uh, sting or poison you. And, um, you know, 250,000 years ago, we also had to deal with the threat of neighboring humans and neighboring tribes. And so your brain is actually set up to do a scan of your environment about every two minutes. And 75% of your lower brain is dedicated really to threat detection and answering the question, am I safe in this moment? We can have the next slide, Heather. Now, in the modern world, we live in an environment where we can order a lot of things by the push of a button uh, or go down and get a latte, or at least we used to be able to go down and get our latte. So our society is, we're living in a smartphone world, but our operating system, our internal operating system is truly straight out of the stone age. And so when we go from a latte sharing environment to, uh, next slide, Heather, to an environment where we're seeing this on the nightly news, or we're dealing with a global pandemic, it's absolutely natural for our underlying lower brain to be triggered in a way that it hasn't been triggered before. And so what we're seeing right now, Heather, next slide, is a whole bunch of frustration, uncertainty, exhaustion, feeling slowed down, anxiety, and feeling unsettled. And so right now, it's not uncommon for you, for your workforce, and for your clients, the people that are coming into your buildings, to be experiencing higher levels of all of these things. At two independent organizations, the U.S. Census Bureau and the Pew Research Organization, uh, independently were doing different research and came to the same conclusion at the same time. In fact, these, these two clips that you see were published within days of each other is that a third of Americans since January have exhibited clinical signs of anxiety or depression. Now, typically, we expect about one in four Americans to experience uh, depression or anxiety at a clinical level over their lifetime. And yet in the last, in the last five months, one third of Americans have experienced clinical levels of anxiety or depression. This is your workforce. It may be you. This is uh, the people that are coming in the door. And we're starting to see this every day. We're starting to see the mental health effects of COVID coming in our doors every day. And so this just reinforces the need for us as leaders to do uh, what Heather was talking about, uh, which is to create psychological safety, cr to create that feeling of of that we're safe and that we're okay. That need is greater than it ever has been before. And so how do we get to where this gentleman is standing on the rock? How do we get to where we can release and be psychologically safe and not have our lower brain really taking over and allow our higher brain, right? Our higher brain is where our reasoning is located. It's where our, um, uh, uh, where our higher, uh, a question just came in in the chat, so that's why I got disrupted there. But really to allow our higher brain of, um, you know, where sympathy and empathy and emotional reasoning were. Uh, there was this uh, question that just came in, what was the pre-pandemic levels of Americans experiencing clinical levels of anxiety and depression? So I'll go back to a comment that I made. Typically, we would expect one in four Americans to experience clinical levels of anxiety or depression or another mental health issue in their lifetime. And now what we're seeing is that one third of Americans have clinical levels of anxiety right now, in this moment or sometime in the last five months. So we've seen an extraordinary expansion of the of behavioral health issues. And this is actually gonna be the third or fourth wave associated with the pandemic. So we have, we have the pandemic itself, we have the economic impacts, and we're going to have the behavioral health impacts coming down the line. So, Heather, if we could advance that slide to the settle the ball. 
So for you as leaders, and this is what I'm seeing for a leader for, for in institutions right now, in organizations that I'm working in, is that it's very important right now to slow the role for you and your teams. And what we say by slowing the role is people are experiencing extraordinary rates of change right now. The COVID pandemic is causing them to, you know, you're experiencing institutional change. People have their children in their house and they're trying to figure out how do I, how do I get them to go to class? How do I engage them during the summer when they might be in, in an after in a in a summertime program? Um, and then they're dealing with economic effects. There may be somebody in the house that's been laid off. There's a lot of uncertainty. And so right now, this is one of those moments where people's security need, you know, the amount of change that they can handle is very low right now because there's so much change going on around them. So it's really about accepting that it's going to be a little bit slower, that, you know, maybe now is not the time for a huge change initiative within your organization. The change that you need to be focused on is what you need to do to survive coming out of the pandemic. And so really slowing the role and settling that ball, right? If we, if we think about soccer players on the field, one of the things that happens, it looks like they're moving the ball in one swift motion, but what they do is they really, they settle that ball and they get very intentional about it in that microsecond before they, before they click it. So one of the things that you can do and you can train your employees to do is if somebody's running around, if they're feeling overwhelmed by the moment, is to really focus on what you can control or influence. What is really in your span of control or span of influence? And if it's not in your span of control or span of influence, we acknowledge it and then we set it aside. And that can be really hard. And so you might be encouraging yourself, you might be encouraging your employees to say, hey, it might be time to limit the social media, right? Set aside the Twitter feed, set aside the nudes feed. And while we're here, Let's really focus as a team on what we can control or influence. A highly effective technique for this for you, for you guys as leaders is maybe having daily check-ins, once a week check-ins with your staff to say, what are we going to focus on this week? What's important now? What's going to make us feel like we're in control and we're moving, thing for, moving things forward? Try to focus on daily accomplishments for your team and ask that question, what's important now? And then start moving towards your what if scenarios. What if state funding is cut? What if my municipal, municipal funding is cut? What's my plan for if we have rolling waves of, of viral activity? Really start focusing on that what if and how it leads to you, uh, how it attaches onto your vision for your organization. Next slide, Heather. So I wanna talk to you right now because everyone's lower brains are so heightened, heightened right now and so in panic mode. I wanna talk to you and give you something in the last five minutes of, of my time here is to give you two techniques for really helping control uh, your level of anxiety and allowing your higher brain to take care of your lower brain. We talk about it being the rider on top of the elephant. We don't want the elephant to get out of control. Okay, so the top-down approach to strengthen your higher brain is exactly what your wise grandmother or your wise old aunt told you, is to focus on nutrition, exercise, mindfulness, which we label here as training, and mindfulness can be prayer, it can be taking a walk in the woods. It can be dedicated time towards meditation or distinct mindfulness training. And then the last thing is sleep, right? We call this nets, to focus on your safety nets. And where I, when I'm doing my presentations these days and I'm working with broad audiences and I'm asking them where it is that they need to be focusing, many of them are saying they are not getting enough sleep. So generally speaking, your average adult should be getting seven to eight hours of sleep. And I ask you now, are you getting those seven, eight hours of sleep consistently? Are you getting good nutrition? 
Are you making sure that you're exercising regularly? And yes, walking counts as exercise, getting out and doing your walks. And are you making time to be mindful? If you do that, your higher brain is going to keep be able to keep the anxiety and the safety checking associated with your lower brain in check. Okay, so that's longer term, higher level. Now let's talk about in the moment. I want to talk to you about a technique called TRIBE. And TRIBE stands for trigger, reflect, interpret, build, and engage. And so right now, our lower brains, our amygdalas are highly stimulated by all the chaos, all the change, all the bad news that's going on around us. So it's very easy for us to be triggered. So what do I mean by triggered? It's that moment where you feel that emotional rise come up inside of you, either positive or negative, because something external has stimulated you. Okay, and so one of our natural things to have happened was when we are negatively triggered is that we try to suppress that because we're trying to be all be good little boys and girls and we're trying to get along with each other and we're trying to not let that emotion show. And what actually happens when we try to suppress our anxiety, when we try to suppress what's going on is, you know what, is we actually increase the power of that anxiety. We increase our, we increase our heart rate. We increase our blood pressure. So what I want to ask you to do is to actually acknowledge what you're feeling, to be able to say internally or externally, if it's appropriate, I'm feeling anxious in this moment. I'm feeling anger in this moment. And if you do that, you will actually put a break on what you are feeling. I got to tell you, this is actually one of the most effective techniques for reigning anxiety, anger, frustration, all of those things in is to acknowledge this. And I work with clients all the time to work with trigger. And then the reflection is to say, why am I feeling this? I'm feeling anxiety. Why am I feeling anxiety? Well, there's a global pandemic going on and things are a little crazy. It's natural to feel anxiety and then to have that reflection. So the interpret and build and engage, I'm gonna save for another time because it takes more than five minutes to go through there, but I really wanna encourage you to grab hold of this acknowledgement technique to say, I am triggered, I'm feeling anxiety, I'm feeling whatever it is that I'm feeling and reflect on why you're feeling it and give yourself permission to say, it's okay that I'm feeling that. It's natural that I'm feeling that. And then to go on from that and say, I want to feel something else. It's a truly simple technique that you can use. But if you can use this and, inst and give your people permission to use this, you will see a fundamental change in the level of stress that's going on in your organization. With that, I will close my comments. I love the questions, and I think we're going to have time for questions, but I'm not in charge, so I'll just be quiet in a moment. <laughs> So, and I just wanted to highlight something that Jonathan had said, you know, to empower your people. And I am a firm believer in modeling good behavior. And so one of the ways that we as leaders can manage the disruption that happens to our organizations or within our organizations is to model that management of that disruption. So the, the moment anybody on this call were to say, boy, I'm feeling anxious right now in this moment because our, our governor's, um, I don't know, response or mitigation plan is in conflict with our mayors, right? That's just, that's just articulating your authentic, your authentic truth in that moment, but you're, but you're acknowledging it. And what you're doing is you're telling your staff or your, 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 you know, your employees that it is okay to have a little bit of anxiousness about that. And then, you know, why might that be upsetting? Is one more conservative than the other? And then to talk about what Jonathan's settling that ball. All right, well, that, that ball just got passed to us. It is not ideal, but let's settle it. And now what if? What if we go this way? What if we go that way? So I think that, I think that there's some slides here and I'm glad that Julie is recording it, but I think there are some slides here that'll, choose, that'll serve as gentle reminders to um, maybe behave a little bit differently this afternoon or tomorrow morning or, or share these slides with your staff and talk about, you know, what they made you think about. So hopefully Jonathan and I have given you some food for thought. I'm just going to advance it 
just to our contact information. So if you want to jot down our contact information. And then Julie, if you want to sort of take over and if there are any um, pressing questions for Jonathan or for myself, we're happy to answer them. But I know you have other things on your agenda yep. today. And I certainly um, want to be very mindful and respectful of that as well. So, yes, and I, I want to let you know, Julie, before you pop back in, is that I have pasted a video about how to use Tribe. I pasted a link to a video about how to use Tribe in the chat box. So you there's additional so resources out there. <laughs> well, you thank you so, so much. Good. Thank you. You know, this was just so amazingly helpful, and I'm so grateful that you both were willing to come and um, share your expertise with our librarians across the state. And I really would welcome and encourage everyone who wants to talk to Heather and Jonathan further to reach out to them. I think we have these amazing resources in our state. I was not, I have to confess, I wasn't aware of Strive or Halcyon Consulting, but a librarian brought um, your, your organizations to my attention and she just talked about how helpful they were to her. So um, I really appreciate the work that you guys are doing and thank you for this really great content. So folks, you have, um, if you want to quickly uh, ask a few more questions, I, I would encourage you to take this opportunity. And if we don't have any questions, then, um, I'm going to um, move forward with the with the remainder of the the presentation. They're a shy group sometimes, <laughs> and that is okay. They okay. have our they have our contact okay. information, and so thank you very much email. for having us. <laughs> yes, yeah, okay. we take requests. <laughs> okay, thank you guys very much, and have a wonderful day. Take care, you everyone. Too. Be okay. safe. Bye. All right. Okay, great. Um, uh oh, do I get, okay, great. All right. Um, so when I first sent out the, the webinar before I actually reached out to Heather and Jonathan, um, these were the topics that I did want to, uh, to kind of focus on. So I am going to go ahead and um, kind of quickly go through them. And I'm going to encourage everybody to share. Um, yes, this is re being recorded. And um, yeah, the, the recording is going to continue, um, if that's okay. Or I know sometimes folks kind of would prefer that it wasn't um, being recorded, but I know people were interested in this topic, so I'm going to go ahead and, and keep it going. All right, so um, the topics were um, burnout, which uh, Heather and Jonathan both spoke about, maintaining staff safety and morale, ensuring open communication, um, different phases of library reopenings, and then focusing on the why, not the how. <clears throat> So I'm not going to spend a lot of time because Jonathan um, kind of spoke to this already, but I, I just want to acknowledge that I think a lot of librarians around the state are feeling burned out. Um, everyone's been asked to do so much in such a short amount of time, and it's, you can only kind of keep up that level of energy and momentum um, for so long before you start taking a physical and emotional and mental toll. Um, and burnout, um, as Heather was mentioning, you know, um, can kind of be exacerbated when people feel like they don't have control, um, when, they're, um, when they aren't even sure of how much control they have to make the decisions in their own workspace or regarding their own staff. They don't have all the information that they need to make a decision. So um, it, it's just really that um, work-related ongoing stress that causes um, emotional and physical um, exhaustion. And really uh, a loss of, of accomplishment. You start questioning um, whether you're being effective or not. So as um, mentioned, these are some of the, the causes. And I think right now, I think probably for most of us, we're all experiencing all of these things. Um, and it's not just our work, right? So you go home and there's a lot of concern about your family, about family members in other states, about the future. There's just, it's so much uncertainty right now. And it's just taken a toll on a lot of people. <clears throat> so the thing with burnout is it kind of affects you in three different ways that you have um, mentally, you start kind of pulling away, um, a withdrawing, a distancing yourself from your work. Um, behavioral, some of the behavioral signs are an increased absenteeism, um, tardiness, taking extended breaks, 
And physically, um, people start experiencing headaches, uh, stomach pain, insomnia, increased uh, substance abuse, and as they're just trying to maybe not feel so much or maybe not feel anything, you know, they just, the anxiety is just too much. So there's um, a lot of um, research about burnout and things that you can do. Um, but really there's three things, <laughs> three main things that you can do are kind of change your um, attitude and you can change your, um, the way that you're dealing with it. And that's what Jonathan was speaking about. He was talking about uh, exercise, diet, getting sleep, um, you know, making sure that you're not taking your work home with you. You can do some of the mindful um, practices, whether it's uh, guided meditations, maybe it's your spiritual practice, maybe it's the walk in the woods as he was mentioning. You can change the situation by asking for help. You know, if you are feeling completely overwhelmed at work, you can ask and accept help from others. You can limit, um, I think Heather was talking about just one daily accomplishment. Instead of trying to do everything at once, you can just focusing on doing one thing. And if you have the ability to, maybe you can delegate, spread out some of the responsibilities. So again, it's helping you to manage what needs to be done. And then sometimes you can't do any of those things. And then it's time to question whether it's time for a new job. And I have to confess that I was at a call with um, other national co uh, coordinators from around the United States, and they are mentioning that there has been a large number of uh, librarians in other states who are, who are doing that last option. They're deciding that this is just too much, and they can't handle it. They can't handle the responsibility of keeping their staff safe in the middle of the pandemic with the limited resources that they're given from their municipalities or whatever. And so for some people, that is what they're doing. They're, um, Megan uh, Fratta of the Health Sciences Library at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, she created this really great online resource guide on burnout, and it includes some links to some really good stress reduction resources, which I have actually tested some of them and shared them with some of my family members, so I can vouch for how good they are. So if you do want to, um, you know, there are resources that can kind of help you and change your um, attitude. <clears throat> so the other thing I wanted to talk about was staff safety and morale, because they are kind of interrelated, right? Um, as um, Heather started her presentation on, on the assumption of how many of the, um, how confident people are in their leadership's ability to get them through this crisis. It's really, I think she said 80, about 80 something percent of people weren't that confident. But there's things that we can do, right? <clears throat> so um, if you are reopening your library, there are some great resources. The CDC has created a resuming uh, business toolkit um, based on their interim guidance for business and employers to plan and respond to the coronavirus disease. You know, it's really hard to believe that just a few weeks ago, librarians were scrambling to find these kind of resources that would help them safely reopen their libraries, but it's great that it's available now. So even if you are reopened, you might want to check out the, um, that toolkit and use some of the great checklists that it has. Um, it includes a restart readiness checklist, information on preventing and reducing transmission among employees, steps for maintaining healthy business operations and a healthy work environment, and a worker protection tool that can be used to identify protective um, measures for interactions between workers and the public. And, but just, you know, before you do reopen or even after you have reopened, it's always important to consider how how the level of spread of the coronavirus in your community and your workplace's uh, readiness to um, protect and manage um, the health and safety of your employees and the public. And I'm so happy to share on this slide um, a photo from the Palmer Public Library. So the Palmer Public Library has this great blog um, that they've created for the library. I think it's called Reading Behind, uh, Between the Lines. And they recently published, well, not recently, I guess it was the 16th of June, they put out um, a blog post to the public explaining what the staff's been doing while the library was closed. And it was just a really great um, communication tool for conveying to the public that they've been working hard behind the scenes and they've been doing all these steps and there was photos of Beth, you know, putting up the plexiglass and the photos of this um, talking about how they're still providing services and they're preparing the library for the 
the public to safely come back. And I think it's really important to do that for the public, but also to de demonstrate that level of readiness to the staff. So that management and saying, look, I take your safety super seriously, and I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure that you're safe, that you know how to be safe, that all of, that we are keeping each other safe during this time. So, um, <laughs> Nationally, the OCLC and the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences are partnering to conduct research on how long the um, virus lives on materials um, that are prevalent in museums, archives and museums, I'm sorry, archives and libraries and museums. And um, the Realm Project is conducting various activities such as, you know, it's doing a, a literature re review of scientific research. It's developing laboratory testing scenarios and identifying materials to prioritize for analysis, it's conducting the actual laboratory test, and it's also gathering and assessing protocols and guidelines for other materials-based service industries. And then on, and finally, they are gathering examples of public and state library plans and protocols for reopening. So they recently published, I think it was on June 22nd, their first um, series of laboratory tests or the first round of tests, and the results show that um, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus was not detectable on materials after three days of quarantine. And I think that's really great for all of us libraries. I know there was a lot of discussion of, you know, how long should I quarantine my materials? Is it a week? Is it two weeks? You know, the five days? How long should I do it? And it's really great to have this scientific um, you know, information that will, can help us make these decisions on how we should be handling our materials. So I, I just want to make sure that if you aren't aware of the information, um, you can sign up for their um, alert and their email uh, notifications and, and just always know what's going on with that project. Okay, I want to check um, the chat. Sorry about this because it's hard for me to, to do both of these at the same time. I'm glad to see people are sharing in there. And I'm gonna go on to the next thing. Okay, um, staff morale. So as I mentioned at the start of this uh, webinar, you know, we are really living in an extraordinary time and, and there's just so much, um, this ongoing upheaval is, is taking a toll on, on employee morale. Um, there was a recent article, I think it was published on the 25th, um, on the HR Daily Advisor, and it's been written. It was written by Nick Chen, and he talks about five ways that you can keep um, morale up as as offices um, reopen. And so, a lot of the ideas that he suggested kind of apply to our libraries as well. So, as um, Heather mentioned about the communication, how important it is to to keep our staff in communication about the decisions that our organizations are making. You know, the first thing you need to do is 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 chart a path. Tell folks this is the way. This is the path that we're taking. And these are the next steps that we're going to be doing as we kind of uh, make adjustments to a changing situation. Um, you want to engage and communicate effectively, and that means like talking to people beyond the normal course of business. So I think it's important to think about your staff as more than just the people doing their specific work-related task in your organization. They are people with families and, and uh, other responsibilities. You know, they're uh, whole, well-rounded individuals, and it's important to you know, let them know that you um, you care about them when they're working in the office. And if you have people working at um, at home, you know, you want to communicate with them as well that, you know, just keep those lines of communication open with your employees, whether they're in the library working or at home working. And use more than one communication method. If you, um, you know, in, instead of, not everybody always responds to the same communication technique, so change it up. It may be, Zoom meetings. I know about. I don't know about you, but I'm so exhausted from Zoom. Um, telephone calls, <laughs> an email message. If they're in the office, a written note might be appreciated. You know, change up your communication so you can reach people in different ways. Um, you know, even though it's the middle of a pandemic, people can still be happy, right? So, um, you know, there was a study. He was mentioning the an Oxford University study that found that. Um, you know, happier people are, are on average 13% more productive. So think about, is there ways that your library can foster an, an environment of positivity and joy even now during the pandemic? You know, I know we're dealing with all the changes, but are there small things that we can do? 
that can help people, you know, uh, get a have a laugh, get a smile, um, enjoy being in the in the building. Compassion, you know, um, we never know what other people are going through, so it's okay to let your staff know that you care about them. It's okay to think, um, you know, to acknowledge that um, someone is feeling anxious or fearful because of the um, pandemic. You know, it impacts people in different ways. But demonstrating that you care um, will really provide your staff with some much needed comfort, comfort and go a long way to improving morale. I think sometimes we're afraid to do that in our workplaces. Um, and as uh, I think it was Jonathan, you know, if you feeling those triggers but you don't acknowledge what you're feeling, then you're really um, the worst for that. And be prepared to adapt. It's hard to plan for a few, any kind of future right now. It's hard to plan for the weekend. Who knows what's going to happen? But you know, you need to convey to your staff that we are, we have to be able to adapt in this evolving landscape, and that we have to be flexible and we have to have flexible attitudes in order to get through it. So those were some suggestions on 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 morale. Um, risk communication. So the John Hopkins uh, Center for Communication posted an article um, by Susan Crin on five lessons for communication um, during a pandemic. So she stressed that good communication lets people know what they should do, how they can protect themselves and others, and helps them balance their fears with concrete information they can use. And I think um, in our library, we generate communication and we're constantly communicating to our public and we can do take some of these um, some of these strategies to heart as well. So um, when it, when you're developing communication that you're going to share with your public, you want to make sure that the communication builds trust. You know, people really do want information um, from sources that they trust. And our libraries are trusted uh, institutions in our community. So make sure that the information that you share is, is correct and that you share it in regular intervals. Um, be consistent in your messaging. Um, if you are hearing um, people in your community share misinformation, you need to counter that. Um, I can tell you that I've been receiving, I've received some communication from some librarians on some questionable um, information. So there's a lot of people, uh, a lot of different levels, believing a lot of things that aren't exactly correct. So when you hear that miscommunication, you need to, to kind of to stop it when you hear it. Um, if you do share information, um, you want to share information that promotes uh, action, positive actions, and you want to be empathetic. There's a lot of different ways that libraries are sharing information with their public. As I mentioned, the um, Palmer Public Library's um, reading between the lines in their blog post was really great. It had some great photos and it was very positive messaging. Um, it, it was hopeful. Um, the Seward uh, Community Libraries has, has their 100% committed to serving Seward safely. I love that. Valerie grabbed that, she created it, and, it, and she's sharing it broadly. And it, it shows her commitment to her community. This is what they value. This is what they're going to do. And all of her communication speaks to that. So, you know, I think um, people do need information from sources with expertise. They need to hear from those um, sources from at regular intervals. Again, your library is a trusted community institution. It's important that you com communicate regularly with the public about what your staff has or was during during the closures, what they're doing now, what services are currently available, um, and how you and your staff are taking actions to ensure the health and safety of the public. And if you aren't doing those things, if you aren't sharing information with the public on a regular basis, and there's lots of gaps between the time that you do share information, people will begin to fill in with inaccurate information from unreliable sources. So, you know, whatever you do, um, be honest about what you're doing, um, what you know, and what you don't know during this crisis. And again, um, that was a great article from Susan Crin. So, what phase is your library in? Are you fully open? Are you fully closed? Are you offering some services or services with, with restrictions? So, um, you know, the degree to which you reopen your library is going to depend on how much um, uh, the spread of, of the COVID in your community um, and how prepared you are to protect the health and safety of your library employees and the public. Um, 
I just noticed when I was checking the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services that they are discontinuing publishing their daily press releases. They are now going to be releasing um, information three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, but if you want to, you can subscribe to the daily um, DSS alerts and you can receive a, a case count summary. So um, it's important that you uh, know what's happening in your community and you want, might want to reach out to your Department of Public Health to find out um, what's going on. There's the information on those, the press alert, uh, press release, releases. Okay. So I know that some libraries are offering um, in-person services. There's some that are doing um, by appointment. Some are fully opened. Some are not, still haven't opened. Um, some libraries are doing minimal services. It really just really depends. Um, and again, I, I'm not going to say that your library should be this, that, or the other. It's up to you. Um, you know your community. You know um, you know your level of ability to be open or not. Um, I did want to finish this um, focusing on the why, not the how. There was a really great interview by um, Matt Finch. He is a strategy and foresight consultant, and he was interviewed on the Circulating Ideas podcast. And I'm, hopefully everybody's familiar with that. So it's a really good uh, podcast. They have a lot of the library um, innovators, thinkers um, uh, um, being interviewed on there. And so he, uh, Matt Finch is a strategy and foresight consultant. And he was, um, he, was, he shared this. He said, the COVID-19 is above all, it's an accelerant of certain trends and developments. And we've seen massive move to online. Inevitably things that seemed impossible for libraries to achieve in the digital space are now happening. So it's a healthy reminder that a library is not a building, nor solely its physical collections. The library is the service and the building only its most evident tool. Closing the building need not close the library. And he says, I thought John Overholt put it well. There is nothing at all contradictory about believing libraries are essential to a healthy democratic society and believing that physical access to library collections is not essential in the midst of a deadly pandemic. So I just think it's important that as we move forward that we think about, we focus on the why and not the how. It's not um, you know, it's why we do what we do. Um, the library is more than the building. And he also says that we are in for a prolonged season of turbulence and change. I don't think he's the only one that thinks that. Um, and which we will increasingly come to understand the ongoing presence of uncertainty in our lives. And he believes that resilient libraries, they don't bounce back. So when people talk about going back to normal, he says we are going to be bouncing forward. We don't know what the future looks like. It's still out there to be determined by each one of us. So I want to thank everybody for um, calling in to the, you know, coming in today. I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope you guys got, enjoyed this webinar, and um, I really um, hope you enjoyed our speakers. I'm, I'm looking forward to reaching out to them again for future, um, future webinars. So I will quickly go through this. I'm sorry if I missed a bunch of questions. <laughs> All right. All right, thank you. Thanks everybody. Um, really quiet, but I'm really glad that you guys were all tuning in. Hope you have a great week. Have a great 4th of July, and we'll um, look forward to talking to you guys again soon. Thank you, Julie. Oh, thank you. Who is that? This is Debbie at the Cordova Library. Oh, thanks, Debbie. Nice to hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, you know, I just want to say I don't think I could have gotten through this without all of the support that the State Library that you guys have provided. Oh, thank uh, you very much. It's been amazing. Um, yeah, I. It's. It's great that you're able to provide these services to all of us.
You are most welcome. It's my pleasure. I, I love what I do, and I love the people I work with, and I have the best job in the world, and I'm just... We'll get through this. We will. <laughs> we will. And I think that, that that having these resources available to us have it, it just it's taken the edge off of the unknown and always given us goals to move forward to to be able to you know work on mitigation plans and reopening phases and get together with everyone else and see what they were doing. Um, yeah, it's been very very valuable. All right. Thank so you. I really thank appreciate you. it. I wanted to say thank you. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Take Bye. care. Bye.